We have lost all feelings for others. We barely recognize each other when somebody else comes into our line of vision, agitated as we are. We are dead men with no feelings who are able by some trick, some dangerous magic to keep on running and keep on killing. A young Frenchman falls behind. We catch up with him. He raises his hands and he still has a revolver in one of them. We don't know if he wants to shoot or to surrender. A blow with an entrenching tool splits his face in two. A second Frenchman sees this and tries to get away and a bayonet hisses into his back. He leaps in the air and then stumbles away, his arms outstretched and his mouth wide open in a scream, the bayonet swaying in his back. A third throws down his rifle and cowers with his hands over his eyes. He stays behind with a few other prisoners of war to help carry off the wounded. Suddenly in our pursuit, we reach the enemy lines. We are so close behind our fleeing opponents that we get there at almost, at almost the same time as they do. Because of that, we don't have too many casualties. A machine gun barks out, but is silenced with a hand grenade. All the same, those few seconds were enough for five of our men to get stomach wounds. With the butt of his rifle, Cat smashes to pulp the face of one of the machine gunners who hasn't been wounded. We bayonet the other before they can get their grenades out. Then we gulp down thirstily the water they've been using to cool their gun. All around there is the clicking of wire cutters. Planks are manhandled across the entanglements and we jump through the narrow gaps into the trenches. Haya hits a massive Frenchman in the throat with his spade and throws the first hand grenade. For a second or so, we duck down behind a parapet and then the straight section of trench in front of us is empty. The next throw whistles over the corner of the trench and gives us clear passage. And as we go past, we toss explosive into the dug explosives into the dugouts. The earth shakes, creaking, smoking, and groaning. We stumble on over slippery fragments of flesh, over soft bodies. I fall into a belly that has been ripped open, and on the body is a new, clean French officer's cap. The fighting stops. We lose our contact with the enemy. Since we can't hold out here for a long time, we are brought back to our original position under covering fire from our artillery. We hardly know what we're doing as we dive into the nearest dugout to grab what we can of any provisions that we happen to see before we get away, especially tins of corned beef. We get back in one piece. For the moment, there are no more attacks from over there. We lie on the ground for more than an hour, getting our breath and resting before anyone says anything. We are so completely done and, and that we don't even think of the tinned beef, even though we are ravenously hungry. Only gradually do we turn into something like human beings again. The corned beef that they get on the other side is famous all along the front. Occasionally, it serves as the main reason for a surprise raid from our side because our provisions are generally bad. We are always hungry. We've got hold of five tins altogether. Those people over there get looked after well. It's the lap of luxury compared to, uh, compared to us a lot here in Hungry Corner with our turnip jam. On the other side, the beef is just sitting around. All you need to do is take it. Hi has also sn snaffled a thin loaf of French bread, French white bread, and tucked it into his belt like a spade. There's a bit of blood on, it, on one end of it, but that can be cut off. It's lucky that we've got some decent food to eat now. We'll still need all our strength. Having a full belly is just as important as a good dugout. That's why we are so keen to get hold of food because it can save our lives. Chodden has even managed to get a hold of a couple of water bottles full of cognac. We pass them around. The evening benediction starts. Night falls and mist rises out of the shell holes. It looks as if the craters are full of ghostly secrets. The white vapor creeps around fearfully before it dares to float up over the edge and away. Then long streaks drip from one shell hole to the next. It's cold. I'm on lookout, staring into the darkness. I feel limp and drained, just like I always do after an attack. And so I find it hard to be alone with my own thoughts. They are not really thoughts. They are memories that come to torment me in my weakness and put me into, into a strange mood. I go up, up go the very lights, and I see a picture of a summer evening, and I'm in the cloistered courtyard of the cathedral, looking at the tall rose trees that grow in the middle of the little garden there, where the deans of the chapter are buried. All around are stone carvings for the different stations of the cross. There is nobody there. This flower-filled square is caught up in a profound silence. The sun shines warm on the thick gray stones. I place my hand on one and feel the warmth. Above the right-hand end of the cloister slate roof, the green spire of the cathedral rises up into the pale blue wash of the evening sky. Between the slender sunlit columns of the cloisters themselves is that cool darkness that only churches have. And I'm standing there and thinking that by the time I'm 20, I shall have learnt the secret of the confusion that women cause in men's minds. The picture is astonishingly close and touches me before it dissolves under the flash of the next very light. I grip my rifle and hold it properly upright. The barrel is wet and I put my hand around it and wipe off the dampness with my fingers.